Well, at 11.30 a.m. on May 29th, 1953, Sir Edmund Hillary achieved fame as he hoisted the British flag atop Mount Everest and became the first human being to ever accomplish the climb to the top of the world. It was a climax to many long months of planning. The right men had to be chosen. The proper equipment had to be purchased. Long hours had to be spent in training. There had to be rehearsals in Nepal and a period of time of, a period of, time of acclimating to the height and the weather and the time and the cold. There had to be an early reconnaissance of the Ice fall, then came the buildup, the stockpiling of supplies and the initial climbs. And not till then were the climbers ready for their final assault on the mountain. Heavily burdened, they clawed their way upward through the cold. Every step was fraught with danger and possible discouragement. Disaster and death lurked behind every crevice and rock. But they kept on, forcing their way to the summit. In places, they hacked up sheer walls of ice, defying fatigue, the raging elements, lack of oxygen, bitter cold. Up, up, up they went, clawing their way between ice and rock, and then up onto the ridge. Steps had to be cut into the snow. Time and strength were running out. A few more whacks with the axe or the hammer or the pitchfork. And the summit was gained. And Sir Edmund and his partner stood where no human being had ever stood before. 29,002 feet above sea level. No man on earth will ever climb higher than that. And in Genesis 22, our passage this morning, and I'd encourage you to go ahead and turn in your copy of God's word to Genesis 22. Another mountain rears its head. Not Everest, but Mount Moriah, where we see two men climbing, not searching for fame, not searching for acclamation, not searching to have their names in the history books, but searching for God. And it's none other than Abraham and his beloved only promised son, Isaac. Abraham's life of faith was launched when they left Ur, in obedience to God's promise that he would make Abram into a great nation and bless him and all the nations of the earth would be blessed through Abram. And over the years, the great promise to Abraham from God was repeated and reiterated several different times with remarkable drama and specificity. At the onset, as Abram, fresh from Ur, traveled through central Canaan, the Lord appeared to him and promised the land to his offspring. And there, the great patriarch Abram built an altar to the Lord. And God promised next, after Lot separated from Abram, taking the best and choicest uh, part of the land, as they stood at this most central part of Israel, had a 360-degree view of the land. God promised Abram everything in sight— And that his offspring would have it forever. Also indicating that his children would number like the dust of the earth. Sometime later, after Abraham rescued Lot from the kings of the north, God dramatically promised Abraham an heir. And God took Abraham under the stars and challenged him to count them if he could. And then God said to Abraham, so shall your offspring be innumerable like the stars. Awed and humbled, Abraham didn't say a word, but the Bible records this. And Abraham believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. Abraham was silent, but he said a silent amen to God. And he was absolutely sure that he would have a son. Hebrews 11.1 says this, maybe you have it memorized. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. And that certainly can be spoken of of Abraham. 
The next day, Abram received God's directives as God told him to arrange parts of slain animals for a covenantal sacrifice. And where, when the sun set, God appeared as a flaming furnace radiating orange in the darkness. And then the glowing furnace of God moved, gliding down the path between the sundered parts of the animals. And that is a unilateral, unconditional covenant made by God to Abraham that announced if Abram's descendants did not take possession of the land that God promised, God himself would be split in two, just like those animals. And so we see that on succeeding nights, Abram was reassured first by God that a countless people would come from his body and that the land would go to that people. Years later, Abram is 99 years old, and God is preparing his heart for the covenant of circumcision, and God changed the patriarch's name from Abram to Abraham, meaning father of many, again signifying that the old man would be fruitful and that nations of kings would come from his lineage. Sarai was also renamed Sarah, reaffirming her role as princess because she would have Abraham's son from whom kings would come and ultimately the king of kings, the lion of the tribe of Judah. God also named their yet to be conceived son Isaac, meaning laughter and promising that he would be born in a year's time. And during those long years, the great promises of a people and a land and a blessing had been reiterated, restated several different times in many ways. And Abraham's growth in faith, though, had been uneven. Faith's mountaintops were always edged by dark valleys, such as Abraham's identical lies to Abimelech and Pharaoh about Sarah not being his wife, the affair with Hagar, which brought on some 16 years of marital misery, but with the birth of Isaac, the departure of Ishmael, and the treaty of Beersheba, Abraham was reassured of a people and a land. And the landmark statements and restatements of God's promise came first when Abraham set foot in Canaan, second when he was under the stars with the Lord, third when he saw the fiery presence of God glide through in between the different animal parts, fourth when he heard the renaming of father of the many, princess and laughter and was circumcised. And finally, when he and Sarah held baby Isaac, the promised son, in their arms, and Abraham called the Lord El Olam, meaning everlasting God. And I say all of that, friends, to bring all of us up to speed so we're all on the same page of knowing that God has been faithful to Abraham and Sarah for decades. He has a perfect track record. He's always kept his word. He's always kept his promises, regardless of the mess-ups that Abraham and Sarah have done. And there have been several. God has been faithful. He's always kept his word. This morning's big idea is this, friends. If you forget every other word that I say, please remember this statement. God wants us to know that growth in faith involves testing. I'll say it again. God wants us to know that growth in in faith involves testing. And so hopefully by now you're in your copy of God's Word of Genesis chapter 22, your phone, your physical Bible, tablet, whatever it is. If you don't have one, look to a neighbor and share their copy of God's Word. But be looking at that as I read Genesis chapter 22, the first 19 verses. And you can follow along or listen along as I read out loud. And I'm reading out of the English Standard Version. Genesis 22 Verse 1, after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac, and he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose, went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. 
And he took in his hand the fire and the knife, and so they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. And so they went both of them together. Verse 9. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his his thorns, and Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men and they arose and went together to Beersheba and Abraham lived at Beersheba. Bow with me as I pray. Lord, our Lord, how magnificent is your name throughout the earth. You have covered the heavens with your majesty. Father, give us grace this morning. Give us clarity. Give us insight. Give us understanding during this time. Father, work through me and my many imperfections and my many weaknesses that your word be proclaimed perfectly through the power of your Holy Spirit this morning. Let it fall on ready hearts and ready souls to receive it, that we, that we may live it throughout our week. Father, teach us something new this morning. All God's people said, amen. Well, the announcement in the opening line of our chapter that God is testing Abraham serves as a cushion for the reader from the shock that I'm sure would follow. How painful would this story be for the first time reader without knowing that it was a test? Also, the understanding that it is a test alerts us to the truth that growth in faith involves testing, our big idea. As God tests our faith, it is stretched and thereby grows. And here, Abraham's faith is going to be stretched to the utter limit. And because he held firm, his faith becomes the great, grand example of faith in all of history And we see from this that the way to increase faith is to exercise it. Trust God as you can and he will give you much more than you ever thought. And you have to trust him even more. It is also important to see that this test came after substantial growth and substantial blessing. Abraham's recent success and recent growth was the ground for greater testing and greater growth. And I think that speaks to you never truly make it as a Christian. You'll never just be perfect as a Christian and have it all figured out. You always have room to grow. And certainly did Abraham, the great patriarch Abraham, friend of God Abraham. We know it was a test, but it's important to remind ourselves that Abraham did not. And the hearing of God's command must have been excruciating beyond words, given the fact that it begins with terms of family endearment. Take your son, your only son, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah. He was Abraham's only son by virtue of Ishmael's departure some 14 to 16 years earlier. Teenager Isaac had been his father's laughter for a decade and a half. And as the child of promise, everything was focused on him. Abraham loved Isaac with that kind of aching parental love, the kind that hurts, if you know what I'm talking about. And those sweet, endearing terms 
are followed by unmitigated horror. Offer him there as a burnt offering on the mountains of which I shall tell you. Three simple unqualified statements. Go, take, and offer him are the bare structure of the command. Now, to an ancient Middle Easterner, burnt offerings suggest this process. First, cutting the offering's throat, then dismemberment, and then a sacrifice by the fire by which all the body parts were to be completely consumed on the altar. And this is the horror that Abraham imagined. Having to do this to his own son, his only son, whom he loved. But human sacrifice took place in her. It wasn't beyond Abraham's experience. Human sacrifice took place in her where he was from. Human sacrifice was part of Canaanite culture. Abraham, this was familiar to him. It was familiar to his conceptual worldview. However dumbfounded and repulsed he may have been, remember Abraham had yet to have, have yet to receive the handwritten Torah, the five books of the Bible, to inform his worldview of the doctrine of God. Yet Abraham did not for a moment doubt God's command. God was asking him to act against common sense, against his natural affections, against his lifelong hope and dream. Him and Sarah have been trying to have a baby for decades, and finally God has provided, and now God's asking me to offer him up? This does not make sense. And Moses, I find mildly irritating, does not tell us how Abraham felt. He leaves us to fill in those lines. And the account actually is artfully minimalist. There's not a lot of detail, just kind of the facts. Also note that Abraham was told to do it with his own hands. With his own hands. Light has fled his life. Laughter was only a memory now. Friends, I just have two points for us to walk through this morning. Two points. The first one is this. Abraham's obedience, verses 3 3 through 10. Abraham's obedience, verses 3 through 10. First, we see initial obedience. Astounded by God's command to Abraham, or even should be more astounded by Abraham's immediate response. Look in verse 3. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac, and he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose, went to the place in which God had told him. At the crack of dawn, Abraham is up obeying God. He's not dragging his feet. He's not putting out a prayer fleece. He's not asking the church to pray for him because he has a tough decision to make. Abraham is obeying God immediately. He's not talking to his community group and trying to figure out he's doing what God commanded him to do and he's doing it wholeheartedly. Gordon Winham notes that he might have been numbed in his mind because of the immense sorrow that he's experiencing because of the order of action that Abraham does. First he gets on his donkey and then he goes to cut the wood. That's illogical. That doesn't make sense. So he's possibly disoriented. Who among us would not be if we were put in this position? But Abraham nevertheless obeyed with quickness and with haste. The wonders increased because after three days' journey, Abraham, Isaac, and the men that were with him saw in the distance the place at which Abraham was supposed to sacrifice Isaac. And so he says to his servants to stay with the donkey because him and Isaac were going to go and worship. But they'll be back. And what I find amazing, friends, is that Abraham is totally sincere that after offering Isaac as a burnt offering, that they would return together. And we know this because the writer of Hebrews says this, Hebrews 11, verses 17 through 19, by faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac, all your offspring shall be named. And he considered that God was even able to, listen to this, Raise him back from the dead, from which figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Abraham so utterly and completely believed God's promise that Isaac's children would carry on the bloodline that he reasoned that God was going to raise Isaac back from the dead after offering Isaac up as a sacrifice on the altar. Abraham envisioned the doctrine of resurrection even though nothing in history up until this point would suggest that that was even possible. 
This was bold, original, informing faith. Next, we see continuing obedience. Continuing obedience. The ascent to the place of sacrifice was too steep for the donkey. And so, verse 6, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. Isaac, with the wood on his shoulders, was like a condemned man carrying his own cross. Indeed, the image is truly prophetic of Jesus Christ, as John's gospel describes as, quote, bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull. And the ascent with Isaac carrying the wood and the father carrying the implements of the sacrifice evidently went on for a while in silence. Look back in your Bibles, verse 6, the end of verse 6. So they both went together. Verse 7, and Isaac said to his father, my father, and he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Isaac's breaking the silence, friends, underscores the father's silent grief. The literal Hebrew parallel addresses my father and my son, and it emphasizes their tender and mutual affection for each other. And Isaac's question, where is the lamb? Where is the offering? Indicates not only his naivete, but his absolute trust in his father. Because he did not have a hint of what was going on because there was nothing in his short life up until this moment to suggest that anything like this would ever happen. Isaac's trust in his father is foreshadowed by the greater partnership of the cross expressed in the familiar words of Isaiah 53. I assume you've heard them before, but let me read them to you. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He had put him to grief, and when he makes an offering for sin, he shall see his offering. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Here in our story in Genesis 22, the descriptive, they both went together, repeated in verse 6 and 8, twice emphasized the victim and the offerer willingly ascending the mountain together. Again, a shadow of Calvary in Christ. Abraham's immortal answer to Isaac, God will provide for himself a lamb for the burnt offering, my son, is the turning point in the story. God will provide for himself, states that Abraham had absolute trust in God, but also allowed for God to be God. And as Isaac asked the question, Abraham can't fully answer it because Abraham himself does not truly fully know what God is going to do. God will provide for himself is at the same time a declaration of trust, an expression of hope, and a prophecy for the future. And it's breathed out in submissive prayer. And as we shall see, Abraham's declaration of faith is going to affect a, in a mighty echo our view of the doctrine of God. Abraham's reply, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering is one of the greatest statements in all of Holy Scripture. And it is a promise that the provision of the lamb for Abraham's offering was to be the work of God alone. And I looked forward to the greater lamb, which God himself would provide for your sin and for mine. And notice the use of the definite article, the lamb, not a lamb. In the old King James Version from which I grew up on, it says, God will provide himself. The theme of the lamb in this passage is found in many places between Genesis and Revelation, at least eight Genesis 4, Abel's lamb pictures an acceptable sacrifice. The Passover lamb pictures deliverance from wrath, Exodus 12. Isaiah's lamb in Isaiah 53 pictures a willing and silent sacrifice. John 1, John introduces Jesus as the lamb who takes away sin. 1 Peter 1, Peter spoke of the redeeming blood of the lamb. Revelation 5, the throngs in heaven extol the worth of the lamb. And heaven itself, in Revelation 21, is adorned by the glory of the Lamb. Throughout Scripture, you see this phrase and terminology of the Lamb, the Lamb, the Lamb, as Jesus as the perfect sacrifice for you and for me. The perfect substitute 
for you and for me. And then lastly, under this section, we see ultimate obedience. One thing is very clear, friends. Abraham could not have offered Isaac without Isaac's consent and cooperation. Isaac was younger, stronger, quicker, more agile. And as a young man, he, he, he could run away if he wanted to. He could have fought off Abraham, who's extremely old. But apparently Isaac had decided to obey his father, whatever the cost, just like Abraham had decided to obey his heavenly father, regardless of the cost. Perhaps Abraham had even persuaded Isaac by retelling of the story of his immaculate supernatural birth that was all from God. God did it. It was impossible. We talked about that last week. There's no way that Isaac was to be conceived apart from God, but it happened. Maybe Abraham even reassured Isaac of all the different promises restated in several different ways to Abraham and Sarah that through Isaac, a, a nation of innumerable people would come. And in quick order, Abraham built an altar arranged the wood in a proper pyre, bound his beloved son around the wrists and around the ankles, threw him up on the wood offering. Picture this scene, friends. How heartbreaking would this have been? I, I just assume tears are pouring down Abraham's face as he bounds his son and he hoists him up on the wood to sacrifice him to God. Abraham reaches for the blade, his trembling fingers, I assume, just convulsed as they tightened around the handle for the sacrificial cut. And, but God graciously here draws a veil over the emotional aspect of this scene. There's no mention of, I just assume, the many kisses of a heartbroken father or the willing submission of a loving son to his father's will as he looks up on his father's tear-stained face. Never was such a loving father and such an obedient son put to the test like this one, friends. The Lord, no doubt, looked on with his own great heart throbbing with compassion at the faithful steadfastness of purpose displayed by both Abraham and Isaac. I've heard this passage preached many times, friends. I assume you do too. It's always focused on Abraham. Isaac had to be in submission as well. At the climax of the test, Abraham, the old man, stretched out his hand, took the knife from its sheath, and raised it over the heart of its son. And at this point, Abraham's faith has reached a pinnacle. For even as he's carrying out God's command, he believed that somehow, I don't know how, but somehow, God would still make Isaac his heir. Friends, listen to me. True faith produces amazing works. I'm going to say that one more time for the people in the back who aren't listening. True faith produces amazing works. Can I get an amen on that, friends? Amen. You with me? Real faith that works, just as the Apostle James, in referencing Abraham's sacrifice in James chapter 2, listen, friends, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. As the scripture was fulfilled, that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, and Abraham was called a friend of God. Growth in faith always involves testing. Second and last point that we have to walk through this morning is this, divine response. The divine response, verses 11 through 19. First, we see divine intervention under divine response. Abram's will is in full motion. And in a split second, the sacrifice would be done, verses 11 and 12. Look back in your Bibles, because I think we just need to re-read these two verses to understand the severity of what's going on. But the angel of the Lord, as Abraham probably has his hand and arm in the air, holding the knife for the sacrificial cut, maybe he was even on its way down. I don't know. I don't want to read too much in the Scripture. But picture this scene, and Abraham hears, Abraham, Abraham! And as I assume Abraham is just crying, he says, here I am. And then the angel of the Lord says, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God 
seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Never was there more a welcomed voice than Abraham's old heart, I assume, soared, as did young Isaac. The one who spoke is called the angel of the Lord, and it's not other than the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ. And the words, now I know, are important because they reflect the happy response of someone who has benefited from someone's goodness to him. Jethro, not Jethro, don't confuse that with the restaurant. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, for example, referring to God's deliverance of Israel from the Egyptians, said this, Now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods. And in our passage this morning, it is God who joyfully exalts in Abraham, having loved him so much to the point of being willing to sacrifice his own son. And the angel Lord said to Abraham's actions proved that he really feared the Lord. Since you have not withheld your son from me. The apostle Paul linked these two words together with God's generosity in giving his son. Romans 8. He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for who? Us all. Abraham's offering clearly foreshadowed the sacrifice that God willingly made in giving his son to die on the cross for you. And for me. Next, we see the, the, the divine provision and the hearing of God's voice. And Abraham, seeing a substitute offering, took place in an instant because the Bible says it does. And God says, Hey, there's a ram, sacrifice that in Isaac's place. Never was there more a joyous and eager sacrifice. And as the flames consumed the lamb, Abraham and Isaac were offering their hearts to God. And the burnt offering declared to God, all we have and all we are, God, is upon the altar. God, consume our lives with your glory. That should be our prayer. That should be our attitude. That should be our focus. The ram became Isaac's substitute. I find it interesting, friends, that this is the first explicit example in Scripture of a sacrifice offered in the place of another. The ram was killed, its blood was shed, its carcass was consumed on the altar. Abraham and Isaac stood back, watched the smoke ascend up into heaven, and consider what Isaac must have felt as he was just on that pile where the ram was now being consumed by the fire, but now he's standing back free. He's standing back, not on the altar. He's watching his substitute, the thing that took his place. Friends, Isaac is like the believers today, friends. We're on our way to eternal death, eternal damnation and hell because of our sin. But God provided the lamb. God provided the substitute, his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus gave his life on the cross in our place, just like the ram died in Isaac's place. That's the gospel. And many of the great truths of salvation at the cross of Calvary are pictured at what happened here at Mount Moriah. Consider these three things. The voluntary nature of the sacrifice. Isaac voluntarily Voluntary, willingly gave himself to be the sacrifice, obeyed his father, just as Jesus willingly laid down his life for you and for me. Second, the substitutionary nature of the sacrifice, as the ram was offered in the place of Isaac, so was Jesus, God's son, offered in our place. And then thirdly, God's satisfaction with the offering, pictured by the smoke ascending, just as he was satisfied or propitiated, that's another big Bible word, with the offering of his son on the cross. And in ecstasy, Abraham shouts out in verse 14, so Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day. And Abraham's initially ambiguous, God will provide, had now been fulfilled more perfectly than he had ever dreamed. Abraham's declaration of faith of God will provide as he and Isaac ascended toward sacrifice had now become the story's end. And we see that God who tests is also the God who provides. The tester is the provider. Both are truths of actual fact, but they must be appropriated by faith. Friends, when God tests you, he will provide for you. 
And we see that the Lord who tests is the Lord who provides. This is what we see about God. And as we go through tests of growing our faith into a greater faith, as God tests us and stretches us and pulls us to the point we think we're about to break or we're ready to give up, God provides. He's always provided. And he provides for every believer. He always has. Last thing before we move on to what we have to take away from this morning. We see divine oath. The divine oath, Abraham's extraordinary act of faith prompted God to do something that he had never done before. He swore an oath by his own name, verses 15 through 18. And when this oath, Abraham had every possible assurance from God. The initial promise made to him in Ur, the promise made to him when he first visited Canaan, the promise made to him again when Lot took the best choice of the land, the promise that he believed under the stars, the promise confirmed by God's unilateral covenant with Abraham when his flaming presence passed through the sundered animals, and the promise of the new names, Abraham, Sarah, and Isaac, and the promise and the person of Isaac himself. And God had sworn an oath by himself that Every promise would come to pass. Again, the writer of Hebrews explains this weight of God's actions. Hebrews 6, for when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself saying, I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. The great encouragement is this, friends. God always keeps His word. God always keeps his word. He keeps every word. Every promise of God is kept. God has sworn and he keeps his promises. And it's so simple. We grow in faith as we believe the bare word of God. The process is just God comes to us with his word and we're challenged to believe it. And when we believe his word, he tests us by stretching us and stretching our faith so it can grow to greater dimensions than it ever did before. There are always valleys next to the hilltops of faith. There are always ups and downs. You know that, I know that. If you live the Christian life for any amount of time, you know there are ups and downs in the Christian life. But God grows our faith incrementally so that we're enabled to give our Isaacs to God. A couple challenges for us all and then we're done. First, do you believe the gospel? Second, do you have true faith? And then third, what are your Isaacs that you need to give to the Lord. First, do you believe the gospel? Do you believe the gospel? What is the gospel? The gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ came and was your substitute for your sins on the cross so you can have a restored relationship with God because you had sin. All the way back to Genesis 3, your sin caused you to have a a broken relationship with God. Adam and Eve were created in perfection, perfect unity, perfect relationship with God. But because of their sin and traced all the way through humankind, that relationship has been broken. But God loved you so much that he sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for your sins so that you could have eternal life in heaven with the Father. Do you believe the gospel? That Jesus Christ is the perfect substitutionary lamb for your life and that you need your relationship with God restored and this isn't popular to say or you'll spend eternity in hell separated from God. Friend, I don't want that for you. I want you to be in heaven one day. I want to see you up there. I want to see us all to have a mini church service of Ankeny Free Church up in heaven together. We have a little potluck together after the marriage supper of the lamb. Amen? I'll see you there. But I want us all to be up there together. Do you believe the gospel? There's going to be a lot of religious people in hell. Can I tell you that? There's going to be a lot of religious people in hell. But there's a difference between being religious and believing the gospel. Do you believe the gospel? If you don't, I'll meet you over here by the lampstand and I'll tell you everything from God's word that you need to know. Second thing, do you have true faith? Do you have faith like Abraham? That God can do mighty things through you. That he's going to take you through some tough stuff. He's going to do some testing in your life. But you know it's going to be okay because God always provides. Even if it doesn't make sense. Faith doesn't have to make sense. That's why it's called faith. 
All God needs to do something amazing in the life of somebody, something amazing in the life of a group of people, something amazing in the life of a church is just somebody or a few people with just some crazy faith. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't, it doesn't go along with the flow. But man, we're trusting God that he's going to do this. Do you believe that God can restore that relationship? Do you believe that he can reach that child? That he can heal that person? That he can do the impossible? Do you believe that? Do your prayers reflect that? Someone once said, what would happen if all of your prayers came true this week? Who would get saved? What amazing things would happen? Or would hardly anything happen? What does your faith look like? And as we close, what are your Isaacs that you need to give to the Lord? Is there anything in your life that you're holding back from God? God, you can have all my life except this thing. Maybe it's my children, my career, my bank account, my toys, my weekends, my spare time, a certain sin, pornography, drunkenness, gossip, lust, filthy language, hate in your heart. What are you holding on to that's holding you back from God using you in amazing ways? Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to that cross I cling. That should be our attitude. That should be our spirit. That should be our mindset. Father, take it all. Our eyes are on you. Testing isn't fun, but growth in faith involves testing. But God gets the glory, and if we're truly resting in him, then it truly is, as the hymnist wrote, it is well with our souls. When trials seem to weigh you down, and you can't get answers when you pray, just wear a smile and lose that frown. Have faith. And trust God anyway. When you're discouraged and feel sad and the skies all turn to gray and everything seems to turn out bad, keep believing and trust God anyway. When the night seems so very long and it seems it will not turn to day, praise God in your heart with the song, give thanks and trust God anyway. When you can't get any peace of mind, when, even when you never cease to pray and answers you can't seem to find, look up. And trust God anyway. Remember God's timing is not ours. And the answers will come one day. Nothing is too hard for God's powers. So cheer up. And trust God anyway. Can I get an amen for that? Do you trust him? Do you have faith enough in God to know that he's going to test you. And he's going to grow you. But he always provides. Bow with me as I pray. Lord God, thank you so much for this time. Father, be with us as we close out this worship service. And Father, that's what it is. It's not a, it's, it's not a time to, 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 to do anything else except to worship you, to, to hear your word proclaimed, to sing songs that are all about you and your goodness and your faithfulness to us and who we are in light of who you are. Father, help us to live out this truth that we learned this morning about how you always provide for us, how you're going to test us, how you're going to grow our faith, but help us to look to you and rest in your goodness. Father, is anyone here this morning who does not believe the gospel? Father, draw them close to yourself. Spur them on to make that decision this morning, to place their faith and trust in your son, Jesus Christ, for their sins, to trust you that you rose Jesus from the dead on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and risen from the grave, that he defeated death, that he defeated sin, And that he is our perfect redeemer, our perfect savior, and our perfect substitute for our sins. God, we love you. We're thankful for times like these. All God's people said.